All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our sixth edition BCBA task list series where we're going through each task list item by itself and breaking it down to the essential pieces that we think you need to know for your BCBA exam. Today, we're continuing with philosophical assumptions underlying the science of behavior analysis. These assumptions help explain the world and how we view the world when analyzing behavior. As always, please like and subscribe for all of our video updates. We have three BCBA videos a week, plus our RBT materials as well. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you do pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard, let's get going. So the philosophical assumptions are an understanding or an agreement about how the world works. We want to standardize as analysts how we view the world and not in a sense that we all believe and think the same things and hold the same values, but when we're thinking about human behavior, there are so many variables, there are so many differences that we have to have some guiding assumptions um, which we all believe. And so these philosophical assumptions are things that are going to guide us as a science, as a community, so we can remain technological and conceptually systematic. So we're going to cover selectionism, determinism, empiricism, parsimony, pragmatism, and philosophical doubt. These principles give us a broad framework for analyzing human behavior. When we get to dimensions, those are much more specific to individuals and individual behavior. These assumptions are much more broad and much more general as far as how the world works. Let's start with selectionism. Think Darwinism. Think how behaviors are chosen over a period of time. Of course, behaviors are chosen through interactions with the environment. And that can either be over a long course of history or it can be with individuals. If we think of phylogenic selection, this selection happens over a long period of time through generations and generations often due to evolution and natural selection. So phylogenic has to do with decades and generations of people and animals passing down behavioral traits. When we think individual learning history, which is what we as analysts typically deal with, we think ontogenic. Selection happens for an individual through their learning history. So each of us have our own individual learning history that shapes who we are Today, when we change behavior, we're thinking often from the perspective of that individual's own learning history. Then you have cultural, where behavior is passed from one person to the next through imitation and modeling and verbal communication. So, for example, for phylogenic, plants in the desert became poisonous to protect themselves from predators. Those who did not develop that behavioral trait would eventually die out or get eaten, or whatever it may be. And that's how we as a species evolve over time. Again, that is phylogenic. Ontogenic is much more specific to each individual person. Determinism, very important, right? The universe is a lawful and orderly place. This is something that we need to stress to stakeholders, and parents especially, who often have a hard time believing that behavior happens for a reason. You might hear all the time that their learner does things randomly. Things happen for no reason. We don't believe that as analysts. We believe the universe is lawful. It's determined and behavior happens for a reason. This is why we identify antecedents and consequences. Those antecedents and consequences give us insight into what happens before and after behavior when hypothesizing the cause. We don't just say behavior happened and we don't, we're not sure why, but we're going to go in and try to change it. There's got to be a why. We avoid attributing cause to hypothetical constructs. So we don't want to say things like the behavior happened because they were frustrated or angry, right? Now, when we think private events, we acknowledge thoughts and feelings are behaviors. So understand the difference between the cause and an actual behavior, right? because we want to try to be as observable and measurable as possible when defining these reasons. So for example, a client does not hit others 
for no reason. The interaction with the environment led to the aggression. It's our job to figure out what that interaction was and what caused that aggression. Empiricism, objective observation and measurement produce the evidence to understand and modify behavior. When we talk about empirical evidence, we talk about proven scientific research, scientific evidence, and that is through object, objective observation and measurement. The key word for empiricism is observation. We want to observe what is happening. We are then going to measure what is happening. Using that, we produce evidence to understand and modify behavior. Observation is critical as a behavior analyst. We do not form opinions or create plans based on indirect measures. An interview is not enough. Document review is not enough. We need empirical observation. When, when engaging in empirical observation, your job is to remain objective and quantify. This is not a time for subjectivity and what you feel and what you, you believe. This is what you see, what you observe, what is actually happening. Example, a parent tells you their child always has a tantrum before bath time. Instead of just believing this, and it's not you're calling the parent a liar, but instead of believing it, you go observe, empirical, empirically observe this child, measure it, and then form an opinion or form an intervention. Parsimony. We want to use the simplest explanation as to why behavior is occurring based on observation and data. I think parsimony is incredibly important. I always stress parsimony to my students and my technicians and anyone else I'm dealing with in ABA. Too often, because you're all smart people and understand behavior, we look for these complex reasons why things occur. In reality, behavior is often quite simple. It's often just a simple interaction with the environment where we can find a simple explanation, and that's the reason why that occurred. So before you try to go complex, think simple, right? Oftentimes, the simplest explanation is the correct one. And the easier the explanation is, the easier it's going to be to treat or change that behavior. It also prevents you from making things more complicated, which can lead to more time and resources and more complications. Remain simple. Once you rule out simple explanations, you then can move on to more complex scenarios. For example, a student shows up late to class. That student is never late. Instead of thinking, well, that student's having a bad day, might be depressed, it's causing trouble. What if there is just traffic? And that might seem like an obvious thing. That's because parsimony is obvious. What is the obvious explanation? What's the simplest reason for this behavior to occur? That's what you want to identify first. Pragmatism. You want to be practical. What does it mean to be practical? It means to put biases and opinion and subjectivity aside and you want to choose interventions or staff or make decisions based on effectiveness. How are we going to achieve meaningful change? That's what you're concerned with. So when you're choosing between different interventions, different strategies, different approaches, pragmatism says you're going to pick the intervention that is going to be effective. Now, we also, we're going to talk about things like cost-benefit analyses and effectiveness and length of time of effectiveness, and decisions you have to make based on the different interventions characteristics. But end of the day, when you're pragmatic, you're being objective, and you're choosing things based on effectiveness. Big part of pragmatism is identifying personal biases and eliminating those personal biases. Biases will prevent you from being pragmatic because you may recognize something that's going to be more effective, but if you have a bias against whatever it is, that may prevent you from making the right decision. So for example, staff management, you like Rachel better as a person, but you let Leanne work on a high profile, high profile client because you think Leanne will be more effective. That may sound easy on paper. In practice, if you're managing 20 technicians, you all have personalities and you all have an opinion. You have an opinion on every single one of them. It's hard to remain pragmatic. Being pragmatic is being objective and making decisions based on effectiveness. 
And then philosophical doubt. I included this one because I think it's really important. We want to question known, we want question known knowledge and facts and remain open to evidence that may prove something else. What does that mean? That means when you read a paper about a token economy, and that paper says one thing, that is great. It's empirical. That is good knowledge. You don't want to just take that as 100% fact for the rest of your life. Think about when you read Cooper and all these studies from long, long ago in the 70s and 80s and how we've evolved and grown since then. If we had just stuck to what we learned in the 70s, we would not be where we are today as a science. And that's where philosophical doubt comes in. Just because your understanding of behavior in the world was one way yesterday doesn't mean it should remain constant. You should grow and you should learn and you should evolve. Same with your interventions, same with your teaching style, your management style. Just because something is true today does not make it so tomorrow. You always want to be questioning and examining your beliefs, your scientific understanding of behavior, and your approaches. So for example, a behavior analyst evaluates new research suggesting a different approach to reinforcement schedules. They adapt their intervention to incorporate these findings after analyzing the data's reliability and validity. I'll give you another real-life example. There's a lot of research right now on extinction. How can we effectively use something like differential reinforcement and limit extinction? And differential reinforcement, by the technical definition, has to have extinction, but a lot of research is now examining how you can differentially reinforce without it. If we weren't engaging in philosophical doubt, that type of research would never take place. Thank you so much for watching. This is A2. Of course, we're going to continue A3 and so on and so forth until we get to the end of the sixth edition. We put out at least one a week of these, and we're going to do our best to get out as many as possible as quickly as possible. So continue to be on the lookout. Make sure you subscribe for all of our content so you get everything as soon as it's posted. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass your exam, you let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.